Hey, thank you for joining us and good afternoon. My name is Sandro Peruza. I'm the CEO of the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers. Uh, this is a members only event. It's called Ontario and its fight against climate change, a conversation with the Ontario Green Party Deputy Leader, Diane Sachs. Before we begin, I'd like to just take a moment to acknowledge that we are coming to you from Toronto, which is a dish with one spoon territory. We respectfully acknowledge the past and present traditional stewards of the land and their unique role in the life of the region. Toronto is on a traditional territory of the Ananishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat people and is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the First Credit Nation. We pay our respect to the elders past, present and emerging. As settlers, we're grateful for the opportunity to work, live and play in this beautiful territory. And I need to add, and our responsibility to protect it. I would also like to take this opportunity to congratulate all the professional engineers in Ontario. We recently celebrated PNG Day in Ontario on March 1st. So PNG Day started in 2018 when OSPE called for the formal recognition from the Liberal, uh, sorry, from the Legislative Assembly of Ontario that every March 1st be declared Professional Engineers Day. So again, happy PNG Day and thank you for everything you do to safeguard our province. So today we're talking about the climate crisis. At OSPE, we understand that climate change is real and that it poses an enormous threat to our society. We also know that the time for action is now. With the upcoming provincial election and as a voice of the engineering profession, OSPE is committed to making sure that all political parties understand the great need to listen to the engineering expertise in order to tackle the climate change. In our recent conversation with our members in consultation for the strategic plan, climate crisis was amongst the top issue that our members are telling us is important to them. So today we are joined by Diane Sachs. Dr. Sachs is one of the Canada's most respected environmental lawyers with 40 plus years of experience in writing, interpreting and litigating Ontario's energy and environmental laws. From 2015 to 2019, she was the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario. She was appointed unanimously by all MP MPPs to report to the legislation on Ontario's environmental, energy and climate performance, and to be the guardian of the Environmental Bill of Rights. Today, Diane is a leader of the Ontario Green, or deputy leader of the Ontario Green Party, and she's here today to talk about her party's climate plan and platform, the roadmap to net zero, the Ontario Greens climate plan. I also want to mention that Diane is a friend of OSPE from her days as the Ontario Environmental Commissioner. We shared the work of both the Environmental and Envi uh, Energy Task Forces, and she and her staff always had the time to listen to us. Finally, I also know that Diane is a proud mother of a professional engineer. Her daughter, Shoshana, is an assistant professor in civil and mineral engineering at U of T and the 2019 recipient of the Young Professional Medal at the Ontario Professional Engineering Awards. So uh, Diane, welcome. Just before we start, uh, I wanna go over today's rules of engagement uh, for our members. So she will present, Diane will present the party's plan after she's done, we will have the Q&A section where you'll be able to indicate, uh, you'll be able to ask a question or provide a comment. If you wish to do so, you can raise your hand in the reaction section at the far bottom right of your screen. Uh, I will call upon you, uh, then you will unmute yourself, turn on your camera, identify yourself and ask your question. Uh, you also have the opportunity if you want to ask a question or provide a comment in the chat function in which case I'll look at it and I will read it out on your behalf. So without any further ado, Diane, on to you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Sandra, for having me and uh, Stuart for organizing and everyone who's making the time to attend on what's always a busy day. Um, and thank you for remembering my daughter. Uh, I'll tell her, she'll be pleased. So the um, three central pillars of the Green Party platform for the 2022 election are now released. Um, our housing policy, which came out last June, the roadmap to net zero, which is our climate to environmental policy, and no surprise sets the benchmark for everybody else, and the mental health policy that was released this morning. And today, obviously, I'm talking about the climate policy. So I'd like to start by letting us all remember why we care about this. 
So I have to ask you, is there some young person that you love? I'm very fond of these two, even though they're really noisy and messy. Um, so think hard about them. The, that young person you love, how old are they going to be in 2050 when we know that the blows of the hammer of the climate crisis are going to be falling much harder than they are today? What odds would you like them to have of a livable future? For me, I'd like the odds to be a lot better than they are. But we know from really good science now that we're headed for deep trouble. Um, I hope you noticed, Eve, despite the war in Ukraine and everything else that's happening, that on Monday, uh, we had the second volume of the sixth assessment from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, I, you know, I don't know many of you, I, and I don't know what your background is, but just a quick reminder that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is perhaps the largest scientific collaboration in human history. It is the volunteer work of thousands of the world's best scientists from all the countries of the world. It was set up by all the countries of the world in order to provide a reliable consensus scientific foundation for government action on climate 30 years ago. And every six years or so, we get a massive update on where we are. And that update comes in three parts. The first part is what's happening in the physical world. The second part is what are the significance of those changes for human vulnerability? And the third part is, okay, well, how can we reduce the climate pollution which is driving these disasters? And that third report we don't have yet, but the second one we got this week. And to quote the United Nations Secretary General, and he's seen a lot of reports in his time, but there is nothing else like this. It is an atlas of human suffering, not just future things, not just polar bears, enormous human suffering, which is here now and going to accelerate dramatically. Um, more than 3 billion of the world's people already living in some uh, climate vulnerability hotspots. Fossil fuels are choking humanity. People on the planet are already getting clobbered. The vulnerable around the world are on a frog march to destruction. This is arson of our only home. The inaction of political leaders and our political leaders in Ontario are, are definitely in that category are criminal. These are criminal acts because delay means death. As the Special Rapporteur to the United Nations Human Rights Council put it a couple of years ago, within the lifetime of today's children, the best case now is widespread death and suffering. And the worst case is humanity on the brink of extinction. And that's within the lifetime of the children who are alive today. We've already had findings of fact, for example, from the court in Australia, that one quarter of Australian children alive today will be hospitalized by climate related disasters and impacts in their lifetime. So the, the impacts are large and growing. Um, I, I just can't over, overstate how grave they are, how present they are and how rapidly they're growing. So um, given that, and again, the Secretary General emphasized we have a vanishingly small window, a small window still available to us to keep a, a livable future. And that window is closing fast. So the purpose of the roadmap to net zero was to map out what is that window. If we take that window, if we want to give that young person that you love a chance at a livable future, we have to start right now, and there's a lot that we have to do. And this is uh, my best guess is what it would look like. Uh, I, I, I'm going to start watching the chat. I, I did see someone say, how do we prepare the plan? Um, well, basically, I spent a whole year doing it. Uh, it was just like writing uh, the reports I did as environmental commissioner, except without a paid staff. Um, so extensive electricity system modeling from an expert on that area. Uh, extensive consultation with people with a broad range of policy experience. I reached out to many different stakeholders. And of course, I drew on all of the work in my last 46 years of, of um, 
fighting for the public interest. Um, it's time to turn rage into action. And these are the key, three key things we know we have to do. Nothing magic about this. There shouldn't be any new news in anything I'm telling you. We need to crush climate pollution. We need to restore water and nature. And we have to find a way to succeed together so that we don't keep leaving more and more people behind. The climate crisis exacerbates inequality. Inequality is already very stark and very divisive. Um, many actions to fight climate change will worsen inequality. If we let that happen, we're going to uh, risk splitting our societies and being unable to deal with the hammer blows that are coming. So succeeding together is a critical part of surviving what's ahead. So let's talk about climate. Um, Canadians by and large know that we're in a climate crisis, it's caused by humans, that it's really bad. But by and large, Canadians fool ourselves that we're the good guys. By and large, Canadians fool ourselves that we're not really bad polluters and that we're climate leaders. And neither of those things is true by a very long margin. We are worse climate polluters per capita than almost anybody else in the world. And even as a country, even though we're a small population, maybe 38 million out of a world population over 7 billion, of the 200 countries in the world, we are one of the 10 or 12 worst in total pollution. And we're definitely the worst per capita in the G7 at a time when we've seen many other countries take warnings and get serious about reducing the climate pollution. Canada has not. Most Canadian greenhouse gas emissions are from Ontario and Alberta. Now these, of course, are production emissions that calculated the way that the IPCC calculates inventories. And so what this ignores is the effect of our consumption. Um, Ontarians consume a great deal that's produced elsewhere, including a great deal of fuel that's produced in Alberta. Uh, what you can see from this chart though is that Unlike most of the rest of the country, Canada, sorry, Ontario has made a significant cut in its climate pollution since 2005. And I hope you all know how that happened. Right? It shouldn't be, shouldn't be news to you folks, but it looked like this. So we were really, really lucky in Ontario. I haven't seen this pattern anywhere else in the world. You go back to 1990, we used quite a lot of coal to generate electricity. And it had been going up slowly over a period of years. And so the filth in the air, people were sort of used to. People don't really react very strongly when things get worse slowly on the whole. And then we opened the Darlington nuclear plant and the Bruce nuclear plant and coal emissions plunged. And guess what happened to air quality? Well, it dramatically improved. And again, nobody really noticed it because things got better and if everyone feels entitled to things getting better and that was all great. And then you might remember there was an accident at one of the nuclear plants and then several of the nuclear units were shut down and the coal use soared. And it soared very quickly in just a couple of years and the air got filthy and people were outraged because, and some of you, I mean, I'm just looking at the pictures, some of you might remember when there was a yellow smear across the horizon when you came anywhere near Toronto. Um, how many of you have somebody in your family that has asthma? Well, my late husband had asthma. We had 53 smog days in 2005 in Ontario. And those were brutally hard days for anybody that had trouble breathing. And so the public health organizations got up in arms and the public was up in arms and people could see the filth and they wouldn't stand for it. And so in the 2003 election, because of the health impacts and the visibility of the pollution, all three of the big parties committed that they would take coal out of electricity, even though none of them knew how to do it. And our electricity system was in pretty bad shape, held together by bailing wire and, and spit in a lot of ways. Um, but in any event, they said, yes, they're gonna get coal out of electricity. And we did by 2014. Uh, the last coal-fired power plant in Ontario closed, and as I showed in my electricity report in 2018, the energy that had been provided by coal was replaced by conservation and renewables, obviously not the dispatchability, but, the, but that's not what replaced the energy that used to come from coal. But 
that was just electricity. And we didn't do really anything else. And you can see that our emissions from everything else stayed basically the same. And in fact, in, in some ways got worse. So now here we are where we're in code red, where delay is death, where every ton is increasing the damage to people alive today. So we're in a terrible rush. There isn't any time to waste, even though it's hard to do things quickly. It's hard to do big things quickly for sure, but we're out of time. So this is our approach. What is most distinctive about our plan is that we start with a carbon budget. So I go back again to the IPCC. The work of thousands of scientists approved by all the governments of the world, which has told us that if we want even a 50-50 chance of a 1.5 degree world, then we cannot emit more for the rest of the century more than 10 times of what was emitted in 2019 or 2020. Now, I certainly would like my grandchildren to have better than a 50-50 chance of a livable world. And we know, and again, reinforced by this week's report, that if we blow past 1.5 degrees, even temporarily, human and natural systems may start to collapse, will start to collapse. More and more will be brittle. There'll be more and more explosive failures. There will be more and more devastation. There will be more and more irreversible damage. So it really matters that we stay within this budget, which for Ontario at most is 1,630 megatons. Now I know for a normal audience, I'm not supposed to use numbers. Every time you use numbers, you lose people, but you're engineers, you like numbers. So let's keep this number in mind. We maximum we could possibly justify using of what's left in the rapidly decreasing absorptive capacity of the natural world is 1,630 megatons for the whole century. I just want to pause for a minute to note that lots of people are making promises about net zero by 2050. I mean, I guess that's slightly better than nothing, but it's garbage because that only tells you when they're going to turn, first of all, if they're real about net zero, which most of them aren't, it doesn't tell you anything about the total carbon budget they're gonna use up between now and 2050. It only tells you they're gonna stop making things worse in 2050. And that isn't enough because the bathtub's gonna overflow long before then at the rate we're going now. So that's where we start. Take the science seriously. We want our young people to have better than a 50-50 chance of a livable future. And sticking within this kind of budget only gives us 50%. Anything more than that reduces the chances of a livable future and every ton counts. So then we have to say, all right, once we know what our maximum budget is, how fast are we going to use it up? Well, there's a lot of reasons to think we need to make the budget last as long as possible. There's some technologies that are still being developed. There's a lot of things we don't know how to do yet. Um, and there are some things that just take time. So we really, really, really would benefit from being able to make this budget last until 2045, which, you know, after all, is only 23 years from now. Um, but we can only make it last that long if we cut dramatically and fast now or there won't be enough left to make it run until 2045. So this is what it looks like. The light green is fossil fuel, sorry, climate pollution from burning fossil fuels. The dark green is every other kind of climate pollution. So cow burps and um, nitrous oxide from soils and methane escaping from oil and gas facilities and uh, uh, limestone uh, you know, breakdown during cement making and so on. Everything else is in that dark green. And our best guess is we can probably cut that in half by 2045. Um, probably not mostly eliminated. And that means we're going to need some real offsets. And that's when we have to think about what does net zero mean? But some of you, I hope, paid some attention to the proceedings in Glasgow in November for the annual conference of the parties. Um, and this was one of the big issues there because again, we see lots of fancy people making fancy uh, commitments that they're going to be net zero by 20, 2050 or China's case, 2060. Um, 
But what does the net zero mean? Is it really zero? And in most cases, it isn't. So if you look, for example, at the Canadian federal government website, when they talk about, oh, yes, we're going to be so great. We're going to be net zero by 2050. How are they going to do it? Well, they, they give two examples, neither of which is real. The first one they say is, okay, well, some companies are going to catch their emissions at the end of the chimney. Well, that's great, but that's not net zero. That's just how companies get their emissions down if uh, they're going to capture them. Okay, great, but that doesn't tell us then what they do with it or whether it really is permanent. Um, and a lot of the things people are planning to do with it, we can't prove are permanent. But the big thing that the federal government says they're going to do is they're going to plant trees. Trees are great. I'm a tree hugger from way back. I spent lots of time planting trees. We need to plant trees. We need to plant lots of trees. We need to plant the right trees in the right place. But to pretend that that's a permanent sequestration of carbon is nonsense, especially in a world where we already live in multiple plagues of diseases that are killing trees and megafires. So California, for example, has a very elaborate system of carbon offsets where they're selling, I mean, people are getting a lot of money for selling carbon credits from not cutting down trees and a hell of a lot of those trees have already burned. And we're only in 2022, we're only at 1.1 degree of heating. The mega fires are going to accelerate rapidly and we're starting to see that already. So there's a fairly small number of things for which we have a good evidentiary basis. Um, are likely to be permanent, at least in the sense of lasting more than 100 years. Uh, I was read an interesting article this week that there's some things that can be done uh, in, with scrap steel, where you can maybe make long-lived products that actually hold on to, to carbon. Uh, certainly biochar is well-established and really valuable for improving agricultural soils and improving their ability to withstand floods and droughts. Um, Cross-laminated mass timber for buildings is another really good example that exists and that we have good evidence for, and that we have the technology for, and that we could do at scale. Um, then when we look at the sector reductions, like how would we allocate this budget? Again, this is, this is preliminary, but my best guess is this. Um, fossil fuels burned for energy by 2045 have to be pretty much eliminated everywhere, um, except there are probably some industrial uses that we don't have an answer for yet or may not have an answer for. So I've provided a certain amount of continuing industrial use, but by and large, everything else has to go. Um, and in the non-energy uses, we can probably cut them in half. And so that means agriculture waste, industrial processes, fugitive emissions. And so we would probably end up, if this all worked perfectly, nothing ever works perfectly, but if this all worked perfectly, we would still need 16 megatons a year of genuine permanent offsets to be able to be at net zero by 2045. And um, I, don't, I don't know how we could do more than that. Now, how do we do all of that? And, and I, I got a comment letter from your organization about our plan. And one of the things you said was, boy, you know, this is going to be really hard and it's going to take longer than you think. Well, we don't have longer than this. And that's the one thing that the science has really showed is it's true. Getting this done fast enough will be really, really hard. But failing to do it fast enough is going to be disastrous. So we're focused on, all right, what will it take to do it fast enough that we avoid major disasters because we really care about the future that's waiting for those young people. One piece is a carbon fee. Um, the federal government fee now goes up uh, $15 a year to $170 a ton. I mean, it's again, it, a lot better than nothing, but still not enough to make it cost effective to create a business case, for example, to change sources of heating in buildings. It's just not big enough to push most of the changes we need given how long we have subsidized fossil fuels for and the way we've built our society. So if we're going to make the change we need by the time we need, the carbon fee has to be a heck of a lot higher. Um, we still need to keep a dividend system, again, it's part of maintaining equity, uh, but the fee has to be, has to grow faster to about $300 a ton. Then there's the question of the energy system. So you folks probably all know Ontario is a major energy importer. Um, it's amazing to me how few Ontarians understand 
that electricity is the smallest and cleanest of our major energy sources. Ontario spends roughly 16 to $25 billion every single year just importing fossil fuels. And that's money that drains out of the economy every single year and doesn't come back. And all it leaves behind is pollution. If we kept most of that money in Ontario, circulating in the Ontario economy, we could, I mean, various estimates, but 800,000 new jobs, anyway, a lot, plus much better air quality, better health, um, and much less vulnerability to disruption from geopolitical dis, uh, upsets and, and unpredictable changes such as we're seeing this week uh, with Russia invading Ukraine. So how do we do that? How do we displace all that fossil fuel? Well, we've got, we've got to be much more efficient, waste less energy, and we have to double our electricity supply. Um, as I mentioned, we had a really detailed modeling work done on the Ontario electricity system, and we can do this. We can double our electricity supply by 2040. Um, is it fall off a log easy? No. Is it practical with existing technology? Yes. Um, the hardest part is probably going to be transmission lines. And, uh, I think, Sandra, you know, when, one of the first things I did with the Ontario government uh, when I joined in 1975 was work on a power line from Bruce to Essa. It took 30 years to build it. These things are tough and they're even tougher now with indigenous rights to be considered. And so this is something we really have to focus on. If we want an electrified economy, transmission lines are going to be critical. And that means indigenous led leadership is going to be critical. And that's something that again, we're doing a really bad job on right now. Um, we don't think we need new nuclear. Um, we have already the majority of our electricity comes from nuclear. Nuclear is not a good partner for renewables. Um, also, nuclear takes a long time to build. It's very expensive and it makes waste forever. Well, just about forever. And we, I mean, I've been practicing law now 46 years. And throughout my entire career, uh, my experience has been that engineers are optimists and lawyers are pessimists. Engineers are optimists, I guess, by inclination and training. Lawyers are pessimists by inclination, training and experience. And engineers have always told me, don't worry, we've got a solution, it'll be fine. And that's what they told us about nuclear energy in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. And one of the um, privileges I had as commissioner was to stand in the warehouse between the jars of nuclear waste that we had stored. And those jars were designed by very good and careful engineers to be safe for 50 years above ground. But of course, the oldest jars are older than 50 years now because the Pickering nuclear plant started operating in 1971. And we still don't have any place to put those jars. And we don't have any way to rejar the old jars. And we just keep hoping that nothing bad is going to happen. Um, we don't think new nuclear makes financial sense. We don't think new nuclear can be justified given that we create um, an enormous burden to be managed by future generations for 100,000 years for our convenience now, but given that we have other alternatives. Um, we wouldn't shut down the nuclear plants we have now if they can continue to run safely, um, but we don't think building new ones makes sense. Once we have clean electricity, uh, more and more clean electricity, we can electrify everything practical, which isn't everything, but there's a lot. Um, we would aim to get to 100% fossil fuel electricity as soon as is practical. It might be possible by 2030. It's uh, the most important thing is to stay within our carbon budget. And we certainly agree with you that right now the electricity system is not a dominant, a dominant source of greenhouse gas pollution. The transportation buildings and industry are a much larger source of greenhouse gas pollution, and particularly vehicles, anything that burns petroleum products, it's more urgent to get those down first. We agree with you on that. Um, but even so, we don't need to keep burning fossil fuels for electricity, and we need to stop as soon as we can. Um, too late for more fossil lock-in, definitely too late for new gas pipelines. We should be closing dangerous ones like Line 5, which is a time bomb under the Great Lakes. And again, I mean, I, my daughter's an engineer. I have enormous respect for the work, work of engineers, but engineers work within parameters. Line 5 was designed to be 
pretty safe for 50 years, and those 50 years expired in 2003. It's not safe now, and it's particularly not safe given the location. Um, we also need to think about the diesel dependent communities, most of which are indigenous and either provide them grid access or clean microgrids. And again, we have ways to do that. Transportation, the largest uh, source of greenhouse gas emissions in Ontario and freight, the only subsector that's doubled since 1990. And we know that the largest driver of Ontario's climate pollution and our environmental destruction is urban sprawl. So absolutely critical stop sprawl to not build any more highways to we need a lot more housing but it needs to be within existing urban areas not taking over uh, agricultural land which we're going to need for food or wetlands or woodlands and we need to make walking and biking much safer and fortunately those are cheap fast things to do um, we need to electrify the dirtiest transit so um, go engines and the 4,000 of the dirtiest school buses. And we have roughly 22,000 school buses in Ontario. And a significant number of them are pre-2008 diesel engines, which are the dirtiest uh, and have a significant health burden on the health of Ontarians, and particularly the children who go in the buses. It's just not safe to keep putting kids in those old buses. So uh, replacing those oldest buses with ele clean electric buses, I mean, that's a high priority just from, from the health of our children. Um, buildings are second largest source of emissions. Um, well, the first thing we have to do again, you know, the old joke is if you're in a hole and you want to get out, what's the first thing you have to do? Stop digging. So every time we install a new fossil fuel something today, we're digging ourselves deeper into a climate hole where delay means death. So the International Energy Agency I mean, which has been a big apologist for our fossil fuels. It was set up specifically to get Western countries all the oil we could possibly burn. Even they came out with a report last year saying, you know, it's too late. We shouldn't build any more um, oil and gas extraction anywhere in the world already now. And by 2025, we have to stop installing anywhere in the world anything new that's fired with natural with gas, furnaces, boilers, we have to stop. Um, what do we replace that with? Well, there's a lot of things we have to do. I mean, yes, I agree with you that if we just left all our existing leaky buildings and um, replaced all of the gas heating with air source heat pumps, we'd have a big problem with peak demand on cold nights. That's true. So we wouldn't do that. It doesn't make any sense to do that. We have to dramatically reduce the heat uh, load required by buildings by making them more efficient. And fortunately, that by and large saves money. Um, we need to convert baseboard heating to heat pumps, which is enormously more efficient. When I wrote my electricity report in 2018, there were roughly 16% of Ontario homes heated with baseboard heating. And a lot of those homes were the oldest, most inefficient um, very high heating demand. And so those are the folks that you see in the stories where they can't afford to keep themselves warm because it costs too much. And they need some focused help to make those buildings more efficient and get rid of the baseboard heating um, and geothermal when we can do it. We do need significant improvement in our geothermal industry. Uh, we've seen astonishing reductions in cost in solar, in wind, in storage, in batteries, in electric vehicles over the last couple of decades. And a lot of that has been great work by engineers. And we're starting to see that same sort of cost curve coming down in other areas such as geothermal. But it needs, it needs a kick start. And so one of the things we would do would be to fund geothermal installations in 100 schools. Schools are really, um, appealing places to put in geothermal. You've got large schoolyards right around them. Um, in some cases, you can put in a large enough geothermal field to serve the community around the school, not just the school, but that should be enough to give the geothermal industry a real running start and a chance to build up the expertise and to bring down their costs. Um, lots of other things in there. Um, 
industry. So yes, absolutely, we, we need to support uh, transformation of our industry. And there's a lot of interest in the, the big polluters in Ontario. They, they can tell that the wind is changing. Um, one of the other things that happened in Glasgow that was that I hope you noticed was the fiscal framework. So Mark Carney brought together asset managers who between them manage 140 trillion US, who all committed. Okay, they said their portfolios would be net zero by 2050. Okay, well that in a quarter maybe you can make a phone call. But the more important thing was that they said they were going to dramatically reduce their the emissions from their portfolio this decade, they're gonna do their fair share of keeping us on track to 1.5 degrees, which can only be done by cutting the uh, total emissions this decade roughly in half. So money is moving. And there were, was also a commitment of first purchasers to be lead buyers of cleaner materials. So industry knows that a lot of things are changing and here are some of the things we will be doing to support them. Uh, one thing you can watch for, we put out a specific uh, position paper on incentives for demand for electric vehicles. We've got one coming out soon on building an EV supply chain in Ontario, which is really focused on how do we support the growth of the EV supply chain industry in Ontario. And that may have some more of the details that you were looking for, Sandro, in mm -hmm. our plan. Um, We've got a, a large uh, $5 billion fund basically for industrial strategy, which would include grants. We've got a $4 billion climate bank, which would provide loans for clean tech and for conversions. You know, things like what we saw last week uh, with the steel plants. I mean, renewing the old blast furnaces would again lock in fossil fuels for the next, you know, 30 years. And we can't afford to do that. So we need to see as the blast furnaces reach the end of their working life, that they be replaced by electric arc furnaces or something similar. Um, we need to see public procurement preferences. Again, the government has to use its clout to be uh, the early purchaser of cleaner products and materials. We need to have standards to make it clear which ones qualify and those standards have to get steadily more stringent. Um, and we need the federal government to bring in border carbon adjustments so that industries that do clean up don't get in with, with flooded and driven out of business with dirty, cheap material from elsewhere. So there is a significant role for the federal government. The Ontario government is really important. It has the largest role in uh, regulatory power on things that affect our climate footprint in Ontario, but the federal government has most of the money as well as the international responsibility, and they have a very significant regulatory authority. So they need to play a big part of this. And uh, I mean, at least at the moment, they've made all these commitments internationally, but the things Ontario, uh, government Canada is going to do, and I, I, I hope you know that so far, Canada has made many, many international commitments on climate and has failed to meet a single one of them. So uh, that's one of the reasons why we're the worst in the G7. So that's a, a really rushed run through our climate platform. Um, we also have a significant piece on water and nature, um, which are also suffering dramatically and we're seeing ecosystem collapses uh, uh, at an accelerating rate. We need to reward climate smart farmers and protect farmland when you're gonna need food. Um, we've got a billion dollars for indigenous climate leadership the only way we're going to be able to, to meet our HE targets of permanently protecting large natural areas. We need to do a lot to bring nature back in cities and especially in the poorer parts of our cities, which tend to be tree deserts and really hot and unpleasant. Um, but these are all things that we have the technology to do and in many cases could do quite quickly. The third pillar of the plan is succeeding together. How do we make sure that we not only don't worsen social divisions, but that we actually take this opportunity to improve them. So here are a few of the pieces. Um, one of them is a dedicated adaptation fund. Uh, what we saw when we had cap and trade was that there was money, uh, and it was my personal job to report to the legislature on whether that money was being properly used. And I can tell you it almost entirely was. 75% um, of it went to 
the MUSH sector, municipalities, university schools, hospitals, transit, social housing, for exactly the kinds of improvements that we need them to make. Um, but there wasn't any money for adaptation. And the federal government hasn't wanted to put up much money for adaptation. And again, this week's climate report has emphasized as the climate hammer blows accelerate, we are already being clobbered and the impacts are going to get worse and worse. We have to spend more on getting ready to survive what's coming. Um, so we need some dedicated funding to make sure we do that. And we need to think about the most vulnerable as we do it, because generally speaking, the poorest people live in the most vulnerable areas and have the least ability to recover when disasters occur. Another really critical part of the plan is to provide a pathway into the green workforce for many more young people. Um, we, we hear constantly from young and not so young people that they want to be part of the green economy, they want to have some hope, they want to be part of the solution, but they can't find a way in. And we hear at the same time from industry that they can't find the right workers, they can't find boilermakers, they can't find uh, retrofit people, they can't find people who really know how to maintain electric vehicles. So um, we have this one piece with a year of free college uh, training and a year of guaranteed work. Now that doesn't create um, engineers with a year of college training, but it will help us with a lot of the simpler tasks where, again, we're missing people, and it maybe can be a step up um, for dealing with people who need higher levels of skill. We've also got um, some money in the plan for businesses to upskill existing employees, and uh, so one of the groups we've been talking to is Iron and Earth. Uh, Sandra, are you familiar with them? Yeah, so they have got this wonderful program um, what they've identified is so many people who work in the oil and gas sector are really anxious to transition. And so Iron Earth has spent five years consulting with people and experimenting and developing rapid training courses so that people can take their existing skills and expertise and move it. And basically, they can do a lot with a 10-day program. So that's another sort of thing where we can, you know, we can't create new engineers with a year of training, but existing engineers can learn how to adapt their skills to the new needs um, and their experiences quite quickly. Lots more details in the plan. Um, one of the key things is that we need to replace GDP as the key metric of government success. GDP only measures money. Mo money doesn't measure most of what matters most to people. And that's part of why we've been driven in the wrong direction. So we need a better metric. And the Canadian Index of Wellbeing is a, a good place to start. Um, someone's going to ask me, how much is all this going to cost? That's a good question. Uh, our best estimate is, at least for the first four years, an extra 8% on the provincial budget, a total of $65 billion over four years. And this is what we would spend it on. Um, uh, a quarter of it would go to the succeeding together, not leaving people behind. It's a lot of money, but we, we, we need to do it. And the rest would be divided you know, pretty um, simply between the sectors, you know, roughly in proportion to their contribution to our emissions problem. And where do we get the money from? Well, a quarter of it comes from redirecting electricity subsidies. We're now spending more than $6 billion a year just subsidizing electricity consumption. And most of that benefit goes to people and businesses who can perfectly well pay for their own electricity use. And it destroys the incentive for reducing electricity use. Uh, we need a chunk of money from the federal government. As I already mentioned, this is their commitments and so on and so forth. So, um, with that background, it comes back to individuals. Now, we know that individual action can't solve climate change. It's collective action primarily that we need, but we also need individual action. And this, and we know what individuals need to do, and it's pretty simple, well, at least in principle. We have to each reduce our carbon footprint at every level, individuals, companies, organizations, municipalities, and we have to reduce it about 7% a year. We need to get ready to adapt to the craziness that's coming, and we need to speak up and vote for the kinds of policies that it's going to take to save us from the disaster that's coming our way. So it's not going to be easy, but it's going to be worth it. And anybody who wants to help, I'll be glad to have your help. So thanks very much. Um, Sandra, I'm happy to take questions. Hey, uh, wow. <laughs> Thank you for a very, uh, very sobering presentation. 
so there have been a few comments already uh, in the chat and a few questions. Uh, so I am going to, um, and again, if, to, to reiterate, if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment out um, to everyone and to, a question to Diane, just raise your hand using the, and at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the reactions button. If you click on the reactions, there's a raise hand, just raise your hand and I will recognize you. Uh, but there have been some questions. You've already addressed uh, the first question around the process of how you developed the plan. Uh, and then there was another question about uh, conceived electricity system modeling, how many new turbines will we need to replace, et cetera? Uh, and how much land would these new wind turbines occupy? Uh, I'm not going to ask you to you know, give the numbers, uh, but can you can you maybe talk to, you know, did you look at this and what sort of things did you consider when you actually looked at transitioning to, um, you know, low carbon energy? Oh, well, absolutely, we did. And the short answer is yes, it takes a lot of space. Absolutely. Um, some of it can be in the lake. I mean, we have, for example, Lake Erie is quite shallow. And there is a lot of wind there, so there's a, a lot of opportunities there. Um, would we? Would it make sense in the end to put a lot of turbines around Hudson Bay, where again there's a large flat area and an enormous amount of wind? Does the transmission make sense from there? I mean, maybe. Um, can it be done in Ontario? Absolutely. I mean, Ontario is really big, <laughs> so. The, this is one of the advantages and disadvantages that we have is that Ontario is enormous. So that helps us in a couple of ways. I mean, for example, you look at Scotland or Ireland, which have already moved very dramatically into reliance on wind and solar for their electricity system. But occasionally they have problems where, you know, basically all of Scotland, there may not be a lot of wind for a couple of weeks. Well, Scotland, if I remember correctly, is 250 kilometers wide. Ontario is 1,500 kilometers wide and um, also a long way from north to south. So we've got a much bigger chance of having a big enough space that there's always gonna be sun or, sun or wind somewhere. Um, plus we have enormous capacity for storage. We have enormous capacity for pump storage. Um, I, I know that uh, I've had some interesting briefings from uh, OPG about the opportunities for pump storage in their conventional reservoirs. You might have heard of um, HydroStore, which just got a quarter billion dollar investment from Goldman Sachs after their rigorous review of technologies all around the world as to how we inexpensively create uh, longer term storage and HydroStore basically does it with a kind of underground pump storage. So they don't need any fancy minerals or metals. They need a hole in the ground, um, some uh, a, a lot of compressed air, uh, some water and a layer between them. So the, the opportunities for storage are growing rapidly. And in addition, of course, we don't have to just store electricity as electricity. We can also store it as heat and cold as we're seeing in things like Blatchford and we're seeing in, in um, even the well in Toronto. Uh, so is there, is there room? Yes, there's room, there's definitely room. Um, I, I don't remember all the the statistics. Uh, Carbon Tracker did a piece looking at the entire world um, based on existing technology. And what they showed is that we could provide enough electricity to displace all the fossil fuels in the world using less land than the fossil fuel infrastructure uses now. Uh, and in addition, we have a lot of opportunities to make um, dual use. So uh, for example, one of the projects that was highlighted in Glasgow was putting solar floating on farm ponds. Well, those ponds are getting too hot now because of climate change. So it's cooking everything that lives in it. It's fish are happier if there's shade and you can float panels on it and land that basically you're creating land that wasn't doing anything before. Um, we can also, if we put solar panels on all of our roads and parking lots, we would have more electricity than we would need in the whole of the, of the province. So we definitely have space. We have to be more creative in how we use it. Okay. Uh, now there's another comment here about nuclear waste and nuclear storage. Uh, nuclear waste storage. So uh, again, you can read it as well, but I'll read it out loud. Nuclear waste is stored in large concrete canisters and I have been in the warehouses with them. The fuel is moved there after many years in fuel bays 
where radiation has decayed significantly. So in, in this opinion, it's uh, under control. Uh, do you have any other information you're privy to as from your years as the environmental commissioner or anything else that you've read that you think that it's not under control? It's not under control. I mean, I agree with you, Pauline, that um, the waste is far more dangerous when it comes out of the reactor than it is uh, after a couple of years in the bay, which is great because otherwise, I would, you know, I would have been dead. But the waste still remains hazardous to humans and the environment for, I don't know, 100,000 years. And so we, by saying, okay, we don't have to worry about it. It's in these nice concrete jars. Don't worry. Well, maybe that's just engineers being optimists and lawyers being pessimists. I have had so many experiences over the years of engineers saying, don't worry. And here, here's an example, um, the giant mine. Uh, Sandra, are you familiar with the giant mine? Okay. So the giant mine, this is a gold mine in Yellowknife. And when I was a young lawyer, I mean, it was producing a certain amount of gold, it was producing a certain amount of jobs, it was producing a certain amount of um, royalties for the government. Everybody said, it's all fine, happy, happy, happy. And for this, they brought in enough arsenic, apparently, to kill every single person in the entire world. And they stored it in holes in the ground. And they said, don't worry, it's frozen, it's permafrost, it's never going to go anywhere. All right. And then they said, well, you know, we can, it's, it'll be cheaper, instead of digging those really deep holes for the ore, we'll just dig right at the surface. So they dug a really big hole at the surface above where they were storing the arsenic. And then climate change. So now we have a much thinner layer, and it's a layer that's melting, and the arsenic starts to escape, which is why arsenic is escaping. So you and I are now paying a billion dollars of tax money to try to freeze the area around the arsenic for a hundred years in the hope that our children, will, our grandchildren will then come up with another billion or two and have some idea what to do with it. This idea that we can just take very dangerous things and, and not you know, put them somewhere and not worry about it, frankly, I don't believe it. Uh, next comment is from Carl, who again agrees uh, with full cost pricing for water and wastewater services. Uh, so how do smaller municipalities cope with that? The bigger ones certainly uh, can do it because of you know more more customers and and uh, customers are closer together. So you have that qu quantity. Um, any any ideas on some solutions for smaller municipalities? Oh, well, for, I mean, it's a really good point. I mean, the first thing is we do all have to accept that we have to pay for things. Um, municipalities don't like raising their property taxes and they prefer instead to blame somebody else and say the federal government or the provincial government, somebody should give me lots of money. One thing I saw when I was commissioner over and over again was uh, smaller municipalities letting their sewer and water infrastructure deteriorate, refuse to raise the money to repair them. Um, you know, so you could, if you invested in them regularly as you went, you could have kept it going for another 20 or 30 years and instead they wouldn't pay for it. So they didn't have to increase their rates. And then the whole thing was collapsing. And then they were on the phone to the deputy minister asking for $40 million for a new system. So municipalities are responsible in many cases for their own problems by refusing to invest. And we just are going to have to get serious about paying for stuff. Um, having said that, there are other things that we've gotten the plan. So one is, of course, that if we, um, one of the many consequences of sprawl is enormously driving up infrastructure costs for municipalities, because if you have people scattered all over long distances, providing them with sewer and water and roads and everything is incredibly expensive. When people are much more densely together, that the cost of infrastructure is much less. And in addition, in many urban areas, we already have lots of underused infrastructure. And you think, for example, of the inner suburbs in Toronto, which were built assuming that every house would have five or six or seven people in it. Um, and now you often have one or two or three people in a house. So you've got underused infrastructure in many places. So appropriate uh, density of development will help provide enough people to pay for infrastructure. Um, more uh, uh, 
Green infrastructure is less expensive. That also provides a cost-effective way of paying for things. Um, Bike lanes are much cheaper to provide than, than roads. That's one of the reasons Copenhagen went dramatically to bikes is they were out of money. So they did cheaper things and the cheaper things worked better. Um, and finally, we do have some money in the plan to help municipalities cope with the transition from a, we're gonna sprawl everywhere world to a, no, we actually have to live in the places that we have. Um, so none of this is going to be um, pain free, but it's also going to have lots and lots of opportunities and advantages. We can't afford the lifestyle that we're living right now either. Um, we have the worst G congestion in North America, worse than Los Angeles, worse than New York City, uh, because of the sprawl that's been built and continue to build sprawl will make that worse. That's bad for almost everybody. It's bad for air quality, it's bad for environmental destruction, it's bad for climate, it's bad for getting our carbon footprint down. So we can have a better life, it'll, but it'll be different. It needs to be different. What we've been doing is wrong. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, there was a time where we had to shut down some of the nuclear stations um, and that's when coal went up. Can you, um, re, I guess, give some more information on that? So I'm going on memory here now, Tom. Um, the, the rumor was that some a worker left something um, in a reactor in a place they weren't supposed to leave it. I, I don't know what the actual cause was, but the um, something like six of the reactors were shut down for several years. And that's why the, the coal went, went way, way, way up. Um, I mean, you can Google it. I could try to look for it for if you like. Um, but I did research it at the time I did my report. Whether I've got a footnote to it in the 2018 electricity report, I don't remember. You could look there. It's posted on my website. Uh, I, I think it was, was it 94? Something I, I, like that. Yeah, yeah, 94, 96. It was, yeah. it was a while ago. Um, I mean, nothing terrible happened. There was no big release of radioactivity, um, but the safety regulators were unhappy. Uh, okay, uh, that, so you mentioned as well in your presentation uh, early on that, uh, you know, Canadians are huge, have huge carbon footprints, uh, and you went into some of the, uh, the reasons why you broke it down by transportation and everything else, but I, I'm surprised we're that worse off than Europe. What is it just an awareness that we, we think that we're good, so we don't look for reasons to save? Is it because we have an abundance of energy? We, we don't think of it. What What's the rationale behind, why do we waste so much energy or why are we such big polluters? Um, well, we drive the most polluting vehicles in the entire world. Um, it takes a lot to build out, beat out the US on the worst, most polluting vehicles. It takes a lot to beat out the Philippines because they drive really old vehicles, but we, we, we've won the crown. We are the worst in the entire world. Um, and a big reason for that is the large size of the vehicles that we tend to drive. Um, SUVs and light trucks and so on are very, very popular in Canada and they have huge carbon footprints as well as uh, really bad air pollution. Um, we have uh, interestingly enough, we have fewer housing units per capita than most of the G7, but they are really big. So we tend to occupy a lot of space, but we have big houses and big apartments, and we heat them a lot. Um, energy prices have been comparatively low compared to the standard of living, so people really haven't had much incentive to make their homes more efficient. Uh, we've had poor government policy. Um, we've had, we've, we've been lazy and greedy is the short answer. I, I, uh, I recently had, uh, well, recently, 2019, had some relatives from Italy come over and, and one um, went to school year. So he lived with us for a year. Uh, and he wanted to, you know, work on his English. So he went to high school here for a year. And so we're bringing him around, showing him the country. And, you know, first off, he was amazed by the vastness of it but also the size, everything was big, everything was big. And, you know, for his mindset was, and he lived in Rome where, you know, there were no houses, it was all, all apartments and condos. He said, why does everyone need a house? <laughs> and I didn't have an answer to that. It just, that's the, 
Canadian dream, right? And uh, the home builders with, you know, be a home believer, everyone needs a house. And I think we need to learn how to build up, not out. Um, it's certainly, I think, contributing to it as well. Now, in your, you'll be happy to hear, uh, and not surprised as well, because I know you've you've followed our work. There's a lot of uh, a lot of things in the platform that OSPE has also advocated for in the past. Uh, first off, a price on carbon. When uh, you know they were looking at the various models for carbon pricing, we were big supporters of the cap and trade system because the money was supposed to be reused uh, to, and and reinvested back into the system. And, and I remember, yeah. I remember attending a session um, hosted by the Ontario Chamber with the new environment minister after the the last election in 2018, and it was in the it was in uh, November or December, so a few months after the election, uh, they announced that they're shutting down the cap and trade system. Um, I won't say who was in the meeting, but I started doing a quick calculation, and it was investor after investor or investment company after investment company. I did the math, and 11.5 and they talked about the amount of investment that was leaving a province because of that decision. And just around the table I was at, um, you know, and there were about 12 of us there. So it wasn't a huge table. $11.5 billion left the province in that one year. Oh yeah, I mean, I knew, I knew people leaving as well. And we burned a lot of people. And if you think also about the large renewable procurement, right? So people around the world, spent millions of dollars submitting their proposals, won contracts, spent more millions of dollars um, working towards their approvals and then had them all canceled for no, with no notice and no reason. And we're gonna need that power. So yeah, we have really burnt our bridges. I mean, Ontario was near the front of the line in terms of being attractive to clean energy investment. And we, we kicked in, uh, the, the teeth in of all those people. Yeah, and it's uh, it's hard to to get to get the trust back in those investors because, you know, the best part about that that was all foreign investment. That wasn't Canadian money, you know, being being reinvested in the province. It was foreign investment coming into the province, uh, and so it's like found money. There's eleven point five million dollars of of outside money coming in to say, hey, we want to invest in these opportunities, and a lot of those green tech companies. Were, were founded by and run by engineers. So it was a, a, a very sad day uh, from an OSPE perspective. Uh, Bob asked a really good question. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, so obviously you're talking about it, um, but I haven't heard anything from the other parties yet. Uh, and certainly, um, you know, again, uh, I know in the early stages of the last, uh, you know, from 2018 to 2020, uh, there was a memo that went out uh, that you know this current government wasn't even allowed to use the word climate change. So how do we, you know, how do we ensure that we get everyone on board that this is a big issue? This isn't a magic wand, um, but I, I think Catherine Hayhoe is right. The most important thing we tend not to do is talk about it. Talk about it. Talk about it. Talk about it. And certainly. You folks, you've got a, a voice. You're trusted by many people. Um, Ed Maybach's 11 magic words, simple, clear messages repeated often by a variety of trusted voices. That's how you change public opinion. So you guys are a trusted voice. You're a trusted voice in, by many people in many places. The clearer you, more clearly you speak up, the better the chance that that will help change the conversation. And another thing that Catherine Hayhoe says a lot, which I, I really like is, she says, you know, think of the, the metaphor. A lot of us who work on climate imagine ourselves trying to push a boulder uphill and it feels overwhelming and it feels almost doomed and it feels exhausting and it feels as if we're not getting any or much support. And I feel like that a lot. She says the better image is to think of the boulders already at the top of the mountain. The Green transition is inevitable. Physics doesn't care. Physics doesn't compromise. Climate change is going to overwhelm us. So we will change. The question is how much suffering do we wanna have in the process? How much economic loss, how much human loss, how much environmental loss do we want in the process? And so if we think of the boulder as being already at the top of the mountain, that change which is inevitable and is coming, 
whether we want to or not, whether we think it's too fast or not, it's coming. And so our job is to add our hand to the, bol to the thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people already putting their hand on the boulder to give it enough of a push to get past the forces of predatory delay and inertia. Because uh, once it gets going, it's going to go. And it's going to go incredibly fast and be incredibly disruptive. But right now, we need to get it going. And the quicker we get it going, the less the pain will be. Right. Add your hand. Okay. Uh, Jeffrey uh, Lee has a, uh, we, so many of our members obviously you know, work in industry, uh, but also many work in government and you know, at all three levels, federally, provincially, and municipally. So uh, Jeffrey's comment is uh, municipalities are the fourth are the fourth front of dealing with climate change, especially on adaptation. However, municipalities need to follow provincial policies such as the growth plan and have limited income sources. So what what would your party do differently then? Well, um, there's quite a bit in our plan about that. Um, you'll see that we've got a pledge to make uh, cities like Toronto charter cities. They need more need more power. So you may or may not know, uh, Sandro, I chaired a committee of the sustainability leaders of the four Toronto universities to provide advice to the city councillors uh, at the request of a number of the councillors and made a presentation to council in October of 2020, where we, we went through basically key takeaways for the city of Toronto. Um, and they were roughly as follows. Number one, that the Transform TA goals were ambitious, but absolutely justified and in many ways, not fast enough for the science, um, but that Toronto's implementation is very weak. That yes, Toronto is, as, as great cities go, comparatively lacking in power, but even the authority that the city does have, it doesn't use well. So um, municipalities need more respect, for sure, but they can also do an enormous amount more than they have been doing. And so seeing uh, Region of Halton and the city of Hamilton, for example, in the last few weeks stand up against Ford bullying and saying, no, we're not going to sprawl way out into our, into our boundaries. I mean, those are really significant municipal decisions that many more municipalities should be making. There are lots of things municipalities can do that they aren't doing. And let's go back again to this question about limited income sources. And remember, a lot of the things that we would do to get off fossil fuels save money. Bike lanes, enormously cheaper than roads. Cleaner air, better local health, better for the economy. Um, we don't have to keep doing things the wrong way. We have so many benefits from doing things the right way. Green infrastructure is cheaper than gray infrastructure and it does more things. So we can't afford to keep living the way we have been. Municipalities that are short of income have indeed a particular incentive to try to adapt. So one thing I would say for municipalities though, um, they should join the climate caucus. So I don't know, Jeffrey, if you're involved in the Climate Caucus, it is a voluntary group of mayors and councillors from across the country uh, who are working together to advance climate action in their municipalities by sharing mutual support and expertise. They've developed a fantastic handbook. Um, they do really good conferences. They have regular meetings. Uh, anybody can join. There are, I mean, a lot of the events are only for electives, but that's the place. If municipalities are struggling with this, Get together with your colleagues. They're working on these issues too, and there's a lot being done. Thank you. Uh, Ali, Ali Haas has a question. Uh, Ali, I haven't seen you in a while. Hope you're doing well. Go ahead. Thank you, Sandra. Appreciate it. Uh, hey, hey, Jayan. Good to, good to see you after a couple of years. So uh, my, my question is about, like, for City of Toronto, I was part of the writing the Net Zero uh, by 2050 strategy about a year, year and a half ago. And uh, based on our meticulous calculation, we estimate that City of Toronto needs to spend about 150 to $300 billion to make the City of Toronto net zero. And now they're pushing to 2040, which, which I'm, I'm super supportive. So my question for you is in your government, how do you pay for the cost of energy transition and how you're going to ensure the most vulnerable part of the society, they're not going to be marginalized even more 
by the increased cost of energy. Thank you. Yeah, um, so really good point, Ali. Um, uh, first of all, the calculations assume that we're doing most of this with money. Uh, I'm not assuming we're gonna do most of it with money. We're gonna do a lot of it with regulation. So this idea, uh, and this is a very widespread idea that if the government wants something to change, taxpayers have to pay for it, I don't accept that. This is a shared problem and it has to be a shared solution and um, some things the taxpayer can pay for and that's the extra 8% that was in our plan. And the rest is going to have to be paid for by all of us. We're going to pay for climate change one way or the other. We can pay a lot less if we prepare an event. And that's something that engineers, I mean, this is your bread and butter, is don't wait for the disaster, get ahead of it, it's coming. We've had a hundred years of evidence that it's coming. It's here now. Are we going to just keep sitting back and saying, you know, I really think somebody ought to pay for this. Or are we going to get ahead and do what we need to do? And we're going to have to do it. Um, so, so I'm not accepting your premise that public money has to be produced for this. Now we do know, as I said earlier, that the $140 trillion has, uh, at least the asset managers of $140 trillion US have already pledged that they are going to move their investment portfolio. So there is lots of private money looking for ways to make money from the transition. And as Mark Carney has said, I mean, we've got hundreds of billions of dollars of climate damage already, but there's trillions of dollars of opportunity in the transition. So we don't need to come up with all the money, but we do need to come up with appropriate rules so that it makes sense to invest and some of that is regulation and some of that is um, you know softening the risk so if you think about our climate bank for example the point is to provide the first tranche of debt because the climate bank is a more knowledgeable lender and it can be a more patient lender and then the commercial banks are much more comfortable once there's somebody in ahead of them so that's the kind of thing that we would do to spring that money loose Perfect, fantastic. So, so what, something we've adopted about a couple of months ago. So we set a sort of a target of 50% reduction in carbon by 2030. So ahead of the science-based target. So something I'm seeing like as, as a sort of an asset manager in the market. So the investment, you're right, is coming from the private sector. But at the end of the day, the question is, most of the time, the expectation is we are just absorbing the cost as part of our operating expense. So at the end of the day, tenants needs to pay for the premium cost. So the, the second part of my question was, look, it is inevitable. Right. So let me talk about equity for a minute. Um, it is a really important part. I mean, I mentioned when I was running very quickly through the plan that the third pillar is succeeding together and how important that is. And we know that by and large, the poorest people live in the worst housing. It's cold in the winter, it's hot in the summer, it's expensive to try to, to heat and cool. They don't have access to capital funding to make the buildings better. And it was one of the real tragedies when Ford canceled the cap and trade program that the money that was going into upgrading social housing was eliminated because those buildings by and large were built cheaply and they haven't been maintained well and they're terrible. So, um, so we do have a chunk of money in the plan to get going on tower renewal. And we know that that can be done. So there's been uh, a, a lot of pilot projects being done by different public housing groups. Um, when I was commissioner, I had the privilege of visiting a couple of public housing buildings in Sudbury in the depth of winter. I don't know, it was minus 25 or something. And these were buildings that had been thrown up in the 60s cheaply and had been really expensive to heat and had had no cooling. And I mean, the, the manager had been never able to give everybody a decent quality of life. There were always some units that were baking hot and some units that were freezing and people complaining and it's bad for their health and it was all vulnerable people anyway. They got $100,000 of cap and trade money. They spent all of that money in Ontario and they were able to cut their energy costs in half, and for the first time ever, give a decent temperature in each of the units. So we know that we can make major improvements in the quality of life for ordinary people, and especially the more vulnerable people, by paying attention to that as we 
choose where to spend the money. So buildings, lots and lots of opportunities. One of the things they did there was put on a solar wall. You've probably seen those. Mm -hmm. It's dead simple, right? It's a basically a black perforated surface just outside the south wall. Dead simple, no fancy mechanical. The sun shines on the wall, it heats the air, the air flows up through behind the thing and, and then you know, it goes into the building. So it provides preheating for the building and it provides shading in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the summer. So there's lots and lots of ideas. I mean, there's lots of Canadian innovators who, who know how we make these kinds of changes. Um, a second thing that a major burden, especially for the uh, lowest income is bad air quality. And we would be improving that dramatically by getting off fossil fuels and particularly by quickly getting off the pre-2008 diesel um, engines, which have an enormous toll on human health. And the third thing is how to get around. So it was amazing to me that how many of the poorest 10% of Ontario own vehicles because they don't have any other way to get to their jobs. And that's because of bad urban planning and bad transit. Um, we can improve the urban planning by stopping sprawl and bringing in more jobs and, uh, and more people uh, within the existing urban area. And we can dramatically increase the ability to get around without a car by having a combination of, well, let's think about transit for a minute. We, subways are great, but they cost a fortune and they take a really long time to build and they're very disruptive. We don't have time for that anymore. Dedicated bus lanes are fast and cheap, super, super cheap. You basically need paint um, and we need more electric buses. So Qtrick helped us calculate that we can triple transit use in the GTA by 2030 with remarkably little cost by adding 4,000 electric buses and creating dedicated bus lanes for all the major routes. And that means that people in the inner suburbs now suddenly have a clean, rapid, comfortable, reliable, timely way of getting around on the bus. And if they are getting income support, if they're on welfare, they're gonna get free transportation on the bus. So they suddenly have an opportunity to get to their jobs. Um, we've also seen this in smaller communities. I think, I think it was, I can't remember, it was Stratford or Kingston anyway. Um, on my podcast, Green Economy Heroes, I've interviewed some of the flexible transit people who've been able to use IT to take uh, municipal transit systems and make them provide enormously better off-peak service that's faster, cheaper for the municipality and enormously better for the poor residents of the community. So we have so many of those opportunities. And, um, and in addition, we've got a, a cash climate bonus for the poorest. Thank you. Thank you, Sandro. Thank you, Diane. Oh, thank you. Uh, there's a quick question here around the use of uh, rebates for retrofits. Any thoughts so, on that? Yeah. Um, so we've got, I, I, I leaned really heavily on the work that was done by Ralph Torrey and Celine Back. Uh, for corporate nights last year, you're probably familiar with that. And what they showed is, I mean, why is it so expensive to retrofit an old house? And I've been through this at, at my old house. And it did occur to me that every 110 years or so, you ought to change the windows. So we went through an enormous, ridiculous amount of money to change the windows, but it, you know, it didn't improve the house all that much because the walls are no good. Um, I mean, it's better than it was. So we know that doing this on a bespoke basis is like getting a bespoke suit from Harry Rosen. It's super expensive. I mean, it's nice, I guess, if you can afford it, but it's a super expensive. It's not a good way to, to scale. Um, but if you can do things at scale, you bring the costs down dramatically. So I'd, I'd strongly recommend looking at um, the corporate night's work last year as to how bulk purchasing standardization um, can dramatically bring the cost down. Here, here's another example. Think about fire trucks. Like every municipality needs fire trucks. When every municipality individually tries to figure out how to buy an electric fire truck, they're faced with huge costs and very, very long waits. So they don't do it. It doesn't have to be that way. If the government were to put in a bulk order to say, listen, we are going to order 
I don't know how many fire trucks we need. I'm making this number up. I don't know, 3,000 fire trucks. And went basically put together a buyer's club for all the municipalities with a provincial backstop to say, we're going to buy 3,000 electric fire trucks over the next, and I'm making these numbers up, I don't know, five years, 10 years. You can then go to the manufacturers and say, we will guarantee to buy every electric truck you can create. This is what we need. Give us, and then call for bids, the cost comes down dramatically. So we know that the cost of things is so high because we're not doing it at scale. And we're not doing it at scale because we're leaving it to individuals, individual municipalities, individual homeowners to figure this out. We can't do it that way. This has to be group action. Um, and I, the other thing I'd encourage you to read is Seth Klein's book, A Good War. Like, What did we do in the Second World War? We transformed our economy to make war equipment and we made it fast and we, made, we became one of the world's um, great providers. And we had 11 million people and we did it really fast because there was clear government direction and a common will and we made it happen. We could do that too. I, okay, Jeff has a question. Jeff, this will be the last question, so go ahead. You can okay, first of all, um, Diane, thanks for the presentation. Thanks also for mentioning Seth Klein's book. It is a remarkable read. It is a perfect read, and it's exactly where our money needs to come from. Money is not the issue on this. But going back to your uh, one of your earlier points, I somewhat disagree with you on 98%. I'm with you. The one thing I don't agree on is, is nuclear power. We need to invest in SMRs. SMRs are a real opportunity. They're a whole lot safer, easier to make. There's many features to that. Right at the moment, we've got 444 nuclear power stations around the globe. There's another 400 plus being planned, 150 in China. It isn't going away. We've got to manage it somehow. But SMRs are a very critical piece of what can help us move forward. Either way, Sandro, Diane, thank you. I mean, a, Jeff, I understand your point. I don't think we need more nuclear in Ontario. Um, as I say, it doesn't play well with renewables, and I don't think it meets our, our load demand. In terms of whether SMRs could make sense in other parts of the world, a lot depends on what we build. So my son-in-law uh, is a physicist, and he many years ago, he was bending my ear about pebble bed thorium reactors and how much safer they would be and, and uh, you know how crazy it is that we keep building the other kind, but that's the kind we keep building. So if we were building much safer reactors that don't produce long-lived hazardous waste and maybe reactors that actually consume long-lived hazardous waste in a, in a safe way and provide high heat, I mean, there, there are some obvious advantages to having a major heat source uh, for industrial use and maybe provide just heating for urban areas. If we can do it safe and smart, maybe there's a role for it, but not in Ontario. I would just add one thing. If fission is no, fusion has to be yes. We've oh, got I'm to invest in fusion. fusion. The problem huh? is fusion. Fusion's been 30 years away for my whole life. If, if, if it's getting hey, here, great, we've, let's have it. We, we've gone from a couple of microseconds of fusion. Two months ago, we actually hit five seconds of sustainable fusion. <laughs> we'll it's, taken us se it's taken us 70 years to get there. It'll take us another 40 to get it done, but we're getting there. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, you know, what I know for sure is that what I know at the moment isn't the whole story. The other thing I know for sure is we're gonna need everything that works. We are in desperate circumstances. So we're going to need everything that works and it hasn't all been invented yet. Um, okay. But what I don't wanna do is bet the planet on magic. I don't wanna say we're not gonna do now what we can because maybe someone will invent something later. We have to do everything we can now with everything we have now and also try to invent things later because Everything that we love is at stake. Well said, Anne. Uh, well said, Anne. So I'm going to uh, just kind of, there was one comment earlier, I think by Tom as well, about re-educating and educating. So I'm going to take the opportunity uh, and take a minute to kind of share with the members uh, what we're doing about educating and re-educating. First off, uh, OSPE has been involved in this file for many years. Um, I know our energy task force, our environmental task force is aware of this, uh, but perhaps not all our members. As I mentioned, we were supportive of the cap and trade system. I'm the current chair of the Canadian Green Building Council's workforce development group that is looking at, you know, how do we develop a workforce 
to build, you know, low carbon infrastructure. And uh, it's, uh, it's a Canadian national group, but we have engineers, architects, technicians, technologists, but also the trades there. So we are looking at that and how do we uh, train more of them to be able to do this. Uh, we have been uh, advocating for the adoption of EVs in Ontario uh, to not only help reduce greenhouse ga uh, gases, but also as an energy storage uh, and increase our capacity using EVs around energy storage. Uh, we did raise very significant concerns about the need for Highway 413 and, and advocated for the increase of more public transportation. Uh, we, uh, we are offering a course in partnership with McMaster on a circular economy for engineers so they can understand the opportunities within the circular economy. Uh, we're doing a, we're part of a consultation around the green building code and looking for improvements around the green building code for energy, uh, uh, for, for again, uh, look for opportunities for both energy reduction and uh, low carbon uh, in, in um, infrastructure. And Diane mentioned Kutrick. OSPI is a, men a member of Kutrick, which, which is a Canadian Urban Transportation Research and Innovation Consortium. We've done a number of research projects in partnerships with, with universities and with transit agencies. And uh, I signed a new research agreement yesterday. So we got funding to do another one with York Transit. So it's, uh, you know, we are doing a lot in this. Uh, we are having consultation uh, sessions and information sessions with our members to educate them on why this is a crisis and why engineers have a role in this. Uh, tomorrow, Engineers Canada is having a session as well. Uh, so you can register, it's tomorrow at noon and it's a national consultation, I guess, or an education session on the role of engineers with climate change. So uh, it's on the Engineers Canada site. It's part of NEM Ontario as well. So National Engineering Month Ontario. So you can sign up uh, with a link there. So Diane, thank you for joining us today, uh, sharing for your perspectives um, and wonderful presentation. And you know, you've been you've been a, a loud, strong voice on this for many, many, many years. Uh, so we wish you the best luck in the upcoming election in June. And uh, we do have. I did mention that we're doing another climate uh, crisis consultation with the members. It's on March sixteenth at six p.m. So you can go to ospi.on.ca. So go onto the website, you can register there. Again, it's free. And I have, you know, one last question. We've got two minutes. I have a question for you, Dan. I, so I mentioned your, your daughter, who is a professional engineer and professor at U of T. There are a number of researchers doing tremendous work on this. And we've partnered with them in the past. Uh, they've reached out to us and, and, and we've done some research with them. We've shared their research. We did a session on the value of green infrastructure versus gray infrastructure. Uh, we did uh, research with U of T with a professor there looking at um, using sensors to reduce the energy consumption in buildings. Uh, so how do we get more people like your daughter and others who are doing tremendous work in this area to share that information with OSP and use us as a conduit to get that out to the members? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I know that when I was commissioner, one of the things that I did was to try to be a conduit between the universities and the policymakers. Um, several of the deputy ministers told me that they really wished they had better access to research. And that was, in fact, the one of the uh, reasons that I started the Climate Act Committee of Sustainability Leaders at the four universities to advise Toronto City Council. Um, well, I, I, you already have good connections with the universities and with the engineering schools. Uh, perhaps you can create a prize. You know, you have already a series of prizes, uh, but you don't have any that I can remember that are directed at research. So maybe you could be creating a climate research prize and or, or more than one and encouraging particularly early career researchers. Uh, that's often when they most need help. Once they're already big shots, they're, they're okay. But um, the, the earlier stage of, of the career is often the hardest. So if you were to create some prizes for that, maybe you would uh, you know, be able to help make good research happen in Canada so we don't lose our best people to the US um, and other places and also get better connections for your organization with those early career people. Thank you. 
Uh, and just a reminder for everyone else as well, um, you know, they have the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. OSPE is partnered with a number of different institutions on, um, it's mainly for undergraduate students, but looking at how do they apply and develop solutions based on those UN Sustainable Development Goals. And one of them is climate change. So uh, we're partnering with, uh, there's an event on March, the March 18th to 20 with Centennial College and Ryerson. And one of the one of the three areas of focus, one is equity, diversity, inclusion, but one of the other ones is climate crisis. So with that, Diane, we're about a minute over, but thank you so much. Uh, again, good luck with the election and I'm sure I'll be talking to you soon. Take care. Well, thank you very much, Sandro. And anyone who'd like to help make real this vision I described to you, give me a hand. Elections in less than three months. My website's voteforDiane.ca and we could use your help. Thanks a lot. Take care. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.